right now? Oh, yeah, maybe. Everything's blurry. Don't worry about it. There we go. Got it. Sorry. Are we on? Yeah. Yep. Okay, let's get the show on the road. I haven't been in class, this classroom for a couple weeks, and I apologize for that because you haven't had your dose of chocolate chip cookies, and many of you got sick and have low energy, so make sure you you know, have a cookie so you can you know, keep your energy up and, and be well, okay? Well, uh, today is the midterm presentations. I want to remind uh, new people, new people in the back, no, uh, um, no smartphones or laptops during the, uh, during the uh, lecture. Um, comments, we don't have time for that right now, but if you have any, any uh, questions about what we saw at the Gate Lab um, or the Tech Fair, um, please let me know. I'll be able to answer those for you, okay? So we got um, not only the sign-up sheet, but also these evaluation forms. Does everybody have one of these? Everybody gets one. So everybody is going to be evaluating the presentations, and this is an opportunity for you to give advice to your classmates about their presentation. And at the same time, uh, you should be seeing what they've done right and wrong and maybe incorporating that into your final presentation. So. Um, uh, what I'm going to be doing with these forms is I'm going to be uh, cutting them up, you know, per team and um, scanning them and sending them to you. So you'll have, each team will have all the inputs from everybody. So that, are, that should be pretty helpful because if it was just me evaluating, that's just one person. But, um, you know, I can miss things as well. So uh, it's important to get everybody's input on this stuff. Um, so read what it says on the front. Uh, there's a couple areas that I'm, I'm looking at, and um, um, it's really important to um, to give your best uh, assessment of, of the team's performance in all these different areas. So at the Gate Lab, we saw those reflective markers. I just want to give you a, a, a give you an understanding about how what's going on there. So there's this concept of a corner reflector. So in 2D. It's just a right angle reflector. And um, any ray that comes in gets reflected in the same direction. And this includes rays coming uh, you know, uh, from the front or the side or whatever. It always reflects back to where the light came from. And in 3D, it's a corner reflector. It's a 3D corner. Um, and they can actually incorporate this into tape. So even though the tape looks flat, it actually has these tiny little reflectors in it, and they cut it out and make it into a ball for those reflectors. And uh, these reflectors are everywhere. You see them on construction workers' jackets. Um, you, see them on, uh, you see them on the moon. The astronauts left a big array of these corner reflectors there, so anybody who wants to can shoot a laser to the moon to that spot, you know, um, <clears throat> just like they did on Big Bang Theory. Okay, remember that? And they can, um, they can verify that the moon is still there and, and there's a man-made object there reflecting the stuff, okay? And this is what it looks like. And you can see when you take a flash picture of it, it really glows brightly. So this is the basis for those re reflectors. So um, today, um, each team is going to have five minutes to present. And hopefully we can get through this pretty quickly so we don't go over time too much. Uh, we're going to take a little break halfway through, um, and um, I just want to tell everybody that the re team re reports are due Tuesday, you know, maybe by the end of the day or, or whatever. Uh, take a look on the website for what I'm looking for. Um, you can send it in Word format or PDF format, um, and it's really important to make it concise and readable. I would rather have, much rather have a readable short paper than a long paper that I have to mark up excessively. Okay, so go for readability. Good grammar, stuff like that. Now, it, it, you know, I think it would probably be best if you don't use line spacing any more than one and a half, you know, uh, line spacing. 
you know, if, if I've seen some um, teams have, you know, big margins and two uh, uh, double line spacing, and that just makes the text too sparse. So um, one and a half line spacing, and that gives me a chance to uh, mark in red in, in between the lines. Uh, and uh, that's going to take me a, a while to do, but I'll, I'll be sending those back to the team as well. So you get, get an idea of, um, um, of uh, how well I thought the, the report was. Okay. Be sure to include any pictures you took. Size them correctly. Have the text flow around the images. Have a caption. Label them, figure one, figure two, you know, whatever. Um, and, um, yeah. If you have any questions, let me know. So this is the slide projector that we're, this, you're, you will be using today. The important elements are this green bar, which activates the, the, the pointer, and the forward advance button right there. That's all you need to worry about, OK? I put new batteries in it, so it's going to last the whole time. And um, it's really good to um, highlight things you want the audience to look at. I have a podium here if you're comfortable standing here. You know, but the bad thing about standing here is that you have to turn around to do it. So that's why I like to stand to the side so I can both see you and, and point. But you know, you can do whatever you want. Okay. So Tuesday, this is really gonna be a lot of fun. You know, we saw an exoskeleton at the VA, but uh, the, the uh, these people at Exobionics in Berkeley are coming down, and they have an exoskeleton that they've been building for several years for, for uh, folks with, um, who are uh, quadriplegic or have had a stroke. Um, and one of the community members will, will be testing it out for you. So it's going to be really interesting for you guys. So um, that ought to be good. Uh, today, these, this is the lineup for the presentations. Um, I'm going to be timing you guys, so try to keep it uh, within the five minutes. And because we have a limited amount of time, uh, there'll be no questions. But if somebody has a question um, for the team, um, I can relay that, you know, to the team or, um, you know, whatever. But, um, yeah, so that's what's going to happen. We'll take a quick break right now to get the first team set up. So if you haven't got a uh, form or signed in yet, you know, now's the time to do it, okay? Thank you. I don't have, this is just a viewer. Oh, I see, okay. Is it possible to reduce further the room lighting so you get more contrast on the screen? No, it's gonna make it too dark. Okay. It's sort of washed out. Well, I think it's just their, their slides. It's visible, but it's just. Oh, thank you. No, it's, it's, you'll see it's gonna to be too dark. Yeah, it's too dark. Yeah, that's that's a little bit better. Is it possible to send a uh, electronic version of the form? Yeah, I'll do that. Um, tell him just to make comments, you know, like uh, team number one, and he can he can write down the comments. Okay. Hold on. Okay, you're on. Team, team number one is uh, one more mile. Make sure you write your comments in the, in the correct place. So you don't want to mess up. Where are you guys going to stand? Right over there.
So really quick background information, there's 285 million people on the planet who are vision impaired, and for them everyday tasks such as jogging become much more challenging. Um, usually they have to resort to using some kind of device like a cane, um, or uh, asking a guide to jog with them. Unfortunately, the guides aren't always available, and the canes for the most part are pretty lacking in terms of what they can provide. Um, plus they tend to be expensive, so we were trying to find something that will make a person allow them to be independent, but also cost them some we had the opportunity to interview Brian Higgins. He's a blind rehab specialist at the Palo Alto VA. And uh, some takeaways we got from that was that this device needs to be able to uh, detect uh, obstacles that are low and not fatigue the user. We also talked about a few solutions that he had that don't work. So two quick things about Brian. One is he's an avid jogger. He loves to go jogging. He does 5K runs all the time. Two. Brian is 95% blind, so if you look on that picture on the right, that's what a person who's not vision impaired can see. However, this is what Brian sees. He's only got a five degree field of vision, so while he does have some sight, he's unable to see uh, tri tripping obstacles that may be on the ground in front of him. So these are some assistive solutions on the market now. As you can see, a lot of them are large, expensive, or very awkward to use while running. This last one, the rectangular one, is the one Brian demonstrated when he proposed, and it's the best one he's found to date. And this is him demonstrating. So it's a quick little video. This is Brian jogging outside the VA. So as you can see, the device is very flimsy. It's bouncing back and forth as he's running, and because of that, the wheels keep leaving the ground. So he's losing his uh, touch with the ground, but he's also losing his ability to stay in a straight line. So the device basically makes him start running off-center. So to jump into our design process, we did a ton of brainstorming and came up with three top designs. The first is a chest-mounted sen like, light sensor with vibratory feedback on the four corners of the chest. Hip-mounted lights that designate a path. I mean, we love this idea because it's LiDAR, it's lasers. Everybody loves lasers. Unfortunately, the technological uh, hurdles that would have been encountered in this, basically um, power supplies, having a computer that does all the translation, and also it's expensive. LiDARs, the cheapest one is $100, but for our uses, the LiDAR would have been about five or $600. This next idea would be pretty cheap to make and is a shallow learning curve for someone who uses a white cane. It's basically a cane with some skis at the bottom to take it off-road and we also looked into um, auditory feedback instead of vibration. So two quick things with this. Um, unfortunately, because of the different angles depending on who's running with it, the sensor would never be guaranteed to be running parallel to the ground so we would get inefficient readings. Also, having headphones on to provide you an audible signal becomes a distraction. If you already have one sense that's impaired, you don't want to impair further senses. And the third design is the one we ended up modifying and deciding to run with. And so this has a stable three-point base. It uses ultrasonic sensor. It um, connects with the ground, which is pretty important for someone who's blind. This is something we also learned from Brian, that to get that tactile feedback of how ground textures change really gives confidence to someone um, who's um, unfortunately, we found that this had a problem where the front wheel would bounce a little bit. Um, this is something that we learned when we were doing our prototyping. So these were some pretty early prototypes of pink foam. It allowed us to play around with the base and how the wheels are in relation to each other, how wide and big it is, and how the handle pivots in relation to those things. And on the right side, you see the electronic components inside. So it's basically an Arduino microcontroller with a pair of ultrasonic sensors that are able to detect distance. And then based off of the distance, they'll send feedback to the two little motors attached with blue tape. So you'll basically get a vibrating indicator saying that there's an obstacle on the left or an obstacle on the right, or an obstacle in the center if both activate. And these, this is our current prototype as it is. Um, we widen the base, we put the pivoting wheel at the back, and um, the handle telescopes as well as rotates for height adjustment. And... Um, Oh yeah, the handle is directly in line with the wheels that have the tactile feedback to, you know, transfer that information more directly. Um, and because of the layout of having the rear wheel, it's much more stable. It has a tiny bit of drag, which allows the wheels to stay straight. 
but it also makes sure that that platform is constantly horizontal to the surface. So your uh, ultrasonic sensors are always reading cleanly up to the front. Um, in addition, we had wires running up to the handle in order to provide the feedback to the uh, motors. So one of the things that we want to focus on for our next improvement is, you see the little image of the hand? That's basically a little wireless uh, component that we've created. Well, our goal is to have one on each wrist that basically vibrates in return. So it's going to be wireless. So you're not going to have to worry about any kind of cables going back and forth. So we want to implement the wireless. We want to do more user testing. Take this thing out on more different, different kinds of trails to get some feedback. And also focus on the aesthetics. Make this cooler. We want this something, it already works. We want it to be something that people are proud to show off and want to share with their friends. And some nice to haves we're considering implementing our kickstand, a more ergonomic grip, smoother pivot wheel, and to make it even more compact and foldable than it already is. And the best part is the way our prototype is right now, it's currently under $50, so it's affordable. Thank you. Thanks. So I'm Nick, I'm Zach, I'm Nina, we are Sachi on the go doing the iPhone and me project. So this is the outline of what we're going to talk to you guys about today, pretty much is taking you through our process from week one up until where we are now. Um, but first a little background. So this is Sachi, she's in the back if she wants to wave hi to everyone. Um, so Sachi had a stroke about 18 years ago that's limited the functionality of her right hand side. And one thing, one problem that she's encountered is that it's really difficult to hold and use an iPhone with one hand because it's so bulky, you really need two hands to use it well. So she's looking for some type of device that will enable her to effectively use and operate the iPhone with one hand while she's on the go. Um, before jumping into solutions, we really wanted to hone in on what is the need and what is the problem. So we did a need finding interview and our goals there were to understand her capabilities and also limitations in how she wants to use the phone. So we were asking all types of questions ranging from what are her favorite apps to how difficult is it for her to pick up a mug of coffee. From there we kind of synthesized the information for that interview in the form of a minimal, minimum viable product. And by that I mean what features and requirements of the product are absolutely necessary for, her, for it to be something that she will actually use. Um, and we kind of narrowed it down to four absolutely key things which are it has to be lightweight, it has to be small, has to be easy to put on takeoff and comfortable. And those four features kind of gave us direction moving forward. Um, in addition to our user need finding, we also did some pretty extensive research on what already exists on the market for holding phones. And there are quite a few different kinds of devices that do this. There's things that you can wear around your neck, things that keep your phone out of water, uh, things that make it easier to hold with your hand or your fingers or on your arm or your wrist. We also looked at different things that hold phones or mount phones on different surfaces, uneven surfaces, um, car mounts, things like that. And combined with our search of existing solutions, we brainstormed, next slide, and <coughs> sketched some of our own ideas. Um, we wanted to look at two categories of solutions, hardware solutions as well as software solutions. So in the hardware, that would be something that Sachi can wear on her arm, wrist, or maybe her hand, fingers maybe something that she can wear around her neck or her shoulders. And we also looked at some lower body solutions as well. Um, and then with the software, we wanted to know what already exists on the phone, as well as what other software solutions might make it easier for Sachi to use the phone. So to move forward, we made some low resolu resolution prototypes by taking products that are already on the market and some other basic materials like Velcro um, and a new material, low temperature thermoplastic, um, to create some proof of concepts and each of our prototypes had specific information that we wanted to find out from Sachi that would influence key features of our next design. So we moved from our minimal viable products to um, prototyping our initial designs um, to finally uh, two weeks ago going to Sachi and Paul's place to test our initial prototypes um, and this was a great experience because it unveiled a whole other story um, about what these products could do, what their limitations were, and what Sachi's preferences were when it came to the devices she could use to 
more easily use your phone. Um, the first thing we, we learned was that we needed to consider uh, Sachi's strength and usability um, when choosing where to uh, place the wearable. Originally, we had ho hoped that the forearm would be a very convenient place to hold the wearable, but we realized that it might not be the easiest place um, because it was kind of hard to see the phone on the forearm and it was also a heavy weight to bear. Um, that directed us more towards the hand, which was a much more comfortable place for Sachi to hold her phone, or, on the, or towards the neck, um, which was a place that made the phone a lot less heavy um, for, for Sachi to use and wear. Um, alternatively, or, or secondly, we also um, realized that we really wanted to focus on mechanisms that promote the usability of the phone. Um, what Nick has in his hand here is a little magnet mount, which uh, makes the phone really easy to put on and take off um, of, the, of the wearable, and it also includes a little ball joint that allows the phone to rotate so you can look at it in different orientations. The last thing we learned was that we wanted to design for security. Um, we wanted to make sure that this wearable didn't compromise the safety of Sachi's phone so that if she was out and about in a crowd that nobody would just easily swipe it um, or that it wouldn't fall off. So based on those things that we learned, we uh, have kind of refined our uh, designs. Um, the first two designs involve thermo low, uh, sorry, low temperature thermoplastic that, Nan uh, that Nina's showing you here. Um, we're hoping to combine that with the strap on the hand um, in one prototype and then the other um, potential uh, use would be a strap that's only made of thermoplastic that goes all the way around the hand. Um, and then our third design is uh, all with a necklace. So looking forward, um, we're going to hope to continue this iterative process of designing and testing um, to refine our design to one that will be the best for Saji. Um, we're expecting to encounter a lot of the trade-offs that we saw where you can get maybe some security but less usability, low, lower weight um, versus ease of use. Um, but we're hoping that we can find the best solution uh, so, that, so that Sachi can uh, have a, a great product by the end of the quarter. Um, thanks for your time. Uh, great job, everybody, on, on your work so far. And let us know if you have any questions after class. Engineering Empathy is next. Team Engineering Empathy. So to begin, we wanted to reiterate the problem we're trying to solve. Right now in the United States, 42 million people in the population are African American. And of this population, African Americans are 20% more likely to report having serious psychological distress. Yet there's a huge gap in access to equity of care. African Americans are 50% less likely to receive mental health treatment or counseling as compared to non-Hispanic whites. 60% less likely to receive prescription medication for mental health treatment or counseling. And of the African Americans who've had a major depressive episode, they're 20% less likely to receive treatment. So to really understand this problem, we interviewed eight different people with varying relationships toward um, mental health disorders, from therapists to doctors to people who actually experience the disability to even parents, and some of the key things we learned from them is that we, one, decided to focus specifically on anxiety disorders because those are very prevalent, and two, also there's a group of people who are willing to make that initial reach out for help, whether that be to like a friend or a doctor, but are worried about continuing either in a therapy process or continue reaching out for help because of the stigma. So for our uh, project, we're going to use virtual reality to, one, affirm the emotions experienced during an anxiety attack so people can understand this is a normal occurrence and also raise awareness by raising empathy and showing the user what therapy is like. So how we got to VR, uh, we had a huge idea dump for brainstorming because we realized that the problem was not only how do we make a product, but how do, how do we really, what's the most effective method of people emphasize, emphasize with um, those with anxiety disorder. Um, so our first idea was to have some kind of wearable device which would be a, a sensor and a, and a wristwatch and shoes, probably in a necklace, 
But then we realized the risk of false positives was too large, and we didn't want to like uh, really tamper. Because if you're working out and you have a fast heart rate, maybe you're stressed or maybe you're just working out. Um, so the second idea we had was to make some kind of immersive experience. And we had a portable exhibit that could be used in schools and communities, centers and uh, counseling offices, where a person would walk into a booth and be immersed um, and see some kind of media projection of a video um, simulating anxiety disorder. And afterwards, they would receive tips and resources to counseling centers in the area. And that led us to our current idea, um, which is to have a VR design where someone is immersed in an experience through, go through um, existing goggles, and afterwards they receive information about um, black counselors in the area or even other black patients who are willing to also be part of a forum to share the information. Um, so talking a little bit about the uh, previous work in the space, VR therapy has been used in clinics for the treatment of uh, phobias and other anxiety disorders for a while now. So you can see some examples on the slides. Uh, in particular, uh, the Virtual Reality Medical Center uses VR to help those patients that are afraid of flying by creating an experience that mimics flying. Similarly, Virtually Better uses software to treat uh, fears such as flying, heights, public speaking, and storms. Several of these institutes, such as CLEVR in the Netherlands, are also conducting research into the potential of VR as a treatment and have obtained some really encouraging results. On the other hand, VR is also being widely used for social awareness these days. Chris Milk is a famous name in this space who has developed several movies to create empathy in people. In fact, his company VRSC recently collaborated with the United Nations last year to develop VR experiences on the Syrian revolution which was screened at the General Assembly sessions last year to sensitize the decision makers. Jeremy Balenson, right here at Stanford, is also doing some research uh, in using VR as a tool for creating empathy. Uh, Facebook has also collaborated with Stanford recently to develop experiences that can be included in high school curriculums to create empathy in students. Yes. So our top design uh, has two elements. One is the VR experience through the goggles, um, which we here. So here we have some video clips from um, the footage that we already filmed that we're incorporating now into the software with Google, Google Cardboard. Um, but also there'd be a tactile element um, where someone who's wearing the goggles could hold on to some handles to simulate um, that, that the handles would, would uh, vibrate to simulate the uh, trembling hands that someone might go through um, for a certain kind of, a, of anxiety disorder. So the video itself is just immersing the user in a situation that involves um, um, anxiety. Uh, and uh, we're currently programming the software for the VR, and we expect uh, so we expect to complete the vibrating handle within about two weeks, and to create the VR experience roughly in about three weeks. Um, and the featured cost, the cardboard costs about twenty-five dollars. <coughs> the motor will be about uh, ten dollars. Sorry about that. And to, to cover it, um, to cover the handle, we were thinking of using silicone molding or ABS plastic and three D printing from the PRL. Um, and the amount of that would depend on our final design. Um, so as Paul mentioned, uh, we have already uh, recorded some elements of the VR experience and have finalized the content and the technology we plan on using. Uh, we've also developed our post-VR network and chat apps that will give an opportunity to the, uh, people, the patients to connect with other people with, uh, with uh, anxiety disorders and the patients in the area. And you can see the screenshots of the app that we've developed right now on the slides. Uh, we'll also be visiting the Virtual Human Interaction Lab at Stanford to get more technical feedback on the VR experience. Um, all this while, we've been working with a Stanford student with anxiety disorder and a CAPS counselor to ensure that we have the inputs and perspective of the primary stakeholders. Um, as regards challenges, our biggest challenge is to ensure the effectiveness of the entire VR experience. And we also want to ensure that the integration of various different media that you're talking about in the experience is as seamless as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. for impact. Okay, you're live. Hey everyone, we're uh, Brace for Impact and we're working on a knee brace uh, orthotics project. I'm Michelle. I'm Reed. I'm Jason. We are all in mechanical engineering. We chose this project because we saw a distinct um, way that we could bring our skills to this project and uh, really help people using what we know and what we enjoy doing. So after talking with Dr. Burke, we found that there are two major issues with when you're wearing a knee brace. One of which is knee hyperextension, which if you don't know what that is, basically when 
stand usually is if you're walking it like this. It should be straight line, but many people actually hyperextend, so therefore the brace really can't support them well, and it actually almost hinders their gait. The other one is, this is actually something I never really thought of, really brought it up. For a knee brace, it really relies on the calf muscle as a support to kind of hold it up and keep it there, but many of his patients, especially ones that are suffering from, I believe it's Rigor mortis? Rigor mortis. No, rigor mortis, not that. Rigor varum. That's it. Um, they don't have that calf muscle. It's basically as if it were just a straight pole. So many of the braces are slipping down from them. Um, and so talking to him, we found that a lot of the issues were the braces slipping off. They often don't have strong joints, which I was actually very surprised. He showed us one that was looked like it would be very sturdy and just from regular walking, not even running or anything, it snapped on one of the joints. Um, it also <coughs> won't stay up, but a lot of the solutions are not very comfortable. I believe we'll show you on the next slide. The most common one is basically from your upper thigh all the way down underneath your foot, almost like a little cradle for your entire leg, and that's the brace. That's just for a knee brace. It's because you don't have enough of the calf muscle to hold it up. Um, <coughs> And then another main thing is to keep the knee from buckling with hyperextension, but not apply so much force that it actually injures the patient more. <coughs> so these are some of the current solutions. This is the brace that we actually have with us that Dr. Burke was nice enough to give us. The middle one is what I was talking about with the apparently very uncomfortable under the foot brace and also apparently a very big pain to put on. And then the last one is the slip-on brace, which he was also commenting a lot of his patients have trouble with because, you know, if they're having joint pain or various ailments, it's hard for them to bend all the way down and have to pull it up your leg because it's very tight. So the biggest part about learning and, and creating this project or this prototype was basically that we had to overcome a lot of the medical knowledge that we didn't uh, understand or know beforehand. So a lot of the stuff that we did in the initial design concepts may or may not have like worked out um, depending on specific medical concepts. So we spent a lot of time kind of learning all of the pain points um, and all of the different uh, medical terms in order to create a uh, design concept. And we basically iterated through probably 10 or 15 different quote unquote top designs until we finally came <laughs> to a few of them that we were um, pretty interested in. Um, we looked at different ways that we could uh, use different materials that absorb uh, sweat and stuff when you're using the knee brace. Uh, we looked at different adhesives. We looked at directional adhesives. And all of this doesn't seem to um, be something that we would really work out. Every single time we went and talked to Gary or talked to a user, they'd be like, oh, like this is why like this may not work. Um, so finally, we kind of, uh, for the hyperextension problem, uh, we basically are trying to prevent the knee from like preferring a straight hyperextension. Um, so basically preventing the knee from coming out of the brace. And uh, Reed's going to talk a little bit about how we did the lower resolution prototype. All right, so this is our pretty basic lower resolution prototype right here. Uh, you can see that we're using surgical tubing as kind of a replacement for the lack in strength of the hamstring right here. And then we're using this uh, latex kind of band material to hold up the brace. Um, and the reason we chose to use this is that it's stretchy, so it allows for a very free range of motion, and it can be put under your clothing without interfering with anything. And this will actually tie into like a belt that we'll design that will um, be very comfortable for the user and uh, allow them to wear it pretty seamlessly. It won't look like anything from the outside. Frog is so far. We're killing it. We feel very comfortable with where we are. Basically, from here, we're going to refine the design that we have of the lower resolution prototype. As we said before, we don't have that much medical knowledge, so every time we come with something, we have to kind of consult with Dr. Burke and make sure this won't actually make the condition worse. Uh, and from there, we're hoping to do some CAD models, test for strength and stuff, because like he said, the joints are really vulnerable, and we just really want to make sure everything's okay and we're not actually making the braces worse. But yeah, we feel pretty good about the path ahead. Thank you. Okay. Game plan is next.
Hi guys, I'm Tom. I'm Isabel. I'm Colin. And we are working on the improved walker project. Um, so we've seen some walkers in class so far, and they vary. There's rolling ones with brakes. There's ones you kind of scooch along. But they've all kind of, we've seen a lot of problems with posture in all of these walkers. With, you know, the typical view of a walker is kind of like this old guy here, like crouched down over, over a walker. And so dealing with that posture was kind of the primary goal of our project. So part of the project is also sponsored by Barbara Beskind, and she is the one who comes in with the ski poles and like the altered ending, and so like she sees that as a mobility device that you can use before you decide to go on a walker. So we did visit Barbara in her home, and we got a lot of great tips and advice from her. And her two key main pain points for her is that when you use a walker, you walk differently from it, and she thinks it basically disables a lot of, of the more elderly people who have like... Um, problems with walking, but it's like making it even worse because they have to rely on the walker instead of being able to use like walking sticks. And the second thing that goes along with that is the fact that it also ruins your posture where you kind of feel the need to hunch over your walker in order to use it effectively. And the fact that she also recognizes a lot of people don't know what is the proper way to use the walker and what is the best like posture to have, how should you hold it, how should you adjust the height, how should you like, walk with it essentially. And she gave us a lot of great tips and advice that she's seen in her years of seeing like other people using these walkers and other devices that people have also used in the process. And given with that, we also took a trip to Avenidas and Sterling observed a lot of different people with their walkers and took the opportunity to interview them and see what their thoughts were. And we actually got a very wide range of responses. A lot of people really enjoyed their walker. They enjoyed the fact that they had one. They thought it was like the best thing that's ever happened to them. They really liked it. They thought like the seat was like great. They had a great time using their walker. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we also had people who really didn't like their walker, who felt like it was sort of like hindering their ability to move around, who didn't really like using them, thought they were a huge inconvenience. And we also had people that were kind of in between. We had people who didn't necessarily use a walker yet, but used walking sticks, who like considered using the walker. And there were just like a lot of different responses. Um, so our main key observations that we got from the session was that a lot of these walkers that people have were gifted to them, and that's a lot of the times that contributed to the reason why they were hit or miss. And people also ha with fancier walkers who had a lot more features, had a seat, had a cushion and everything, they often had the worst posture because they just had so much stuff in front of them that they had to hunch over the walker in order to use it. And some of the simple walkers actually helped them become, like walk a little bit more upright because there's just like less stuff going on. And, but at the same time, the simple walkers walkers did lack a lot of the accessories that a lot of the people enjoyed using in their everyday lives. Um, yeah, so currently on the market, uh, there are three main types of walkers. They're the ones without wheels entirely. They're the ones with um, two wheels and the ones with four wheels. Um, the four wheel ones are typically the fanciest ones. They're the most expensive. Uh, they have a braking system. They have chairs. They have baskets. Um, these are the ones people typically uh, desire just because like, they seem the coolest. Um, the problem with them, as Evelyn said, is that people can't actually be in the walker, um, so they have to hunch forward. Um, we do have one, uh, as my, many of you saw during the activities fair, um, a guy brought uh, this walker, uh, which we believe fixes a lot of the problems because it has the four wheels, which people like, and you can stand inside the walker, and then it also uses your center of mass to um, keep you balanced upright. Uh, the only problem with this design is that it's going to be very expensive. It's in the early testing phase. Um, it's also going to require uh, people to buy entirely new walkers, which is expensive. And so we want to use some of the best aspects of this design, um, but make them add-ons so that people can put it on their current walkers to make them better instead of buying entirely new ones. Um, we also uh, we want to basically use the design where you stand inside the simpler walkers, the cheapest ones, and then just make them more desirable to people who are buying fancier ones and um, suffering because of that. Uh, so, so we bought um, the simplest walker design. Um, and then what we're thinking of doing is actually taking uh, three approaches. Uh, we're going to add a seat on, um, a simple attachment that will fold down. Um, it'll also have clamps so it can come off. And then we're also, uh, so that'll make the walker more desirable to people who typically buy the fancier walkers. Our second approach is to add handles that incentivize somebody to stand in the walker and not um, hunch over. 
And so we really uh, are going to need to test that. Um, we're going to try, probably try to make a couple different designs to see what works the best, because right now we only have our intuition, um, and we're not quite sure. We're thinking of doing a 45 degree angle on the handles. And then our third approach is um, some kind of instruction booklet to show people how to use a walker. So just going over the next steps, we're going to continue prototyping. Like, like Isabel said, we're going to try to take some of these handles into Avenidas um, and, and see which, which one of those handles work the best um, for four people in walkers. Uh, doing those user tests, more interviews, and then we're actually going to look into extra add-ons. What else can we put on the walker that's going to be useful in everyday life for people? Reflective tape is something that would be really easy to put on walkers that currently aren't on walkers that are sold commercially, but allow you to have a lot more flexibility in walking outside at night, um, and so people can see you. And also, to make the walker more aesthetically pleasing. Right now, the walker we have kind of has these random blue handles to fold it up. Uh, it's, it's kind of like a, it just doesn't look very good, and so exploring how we can make it more aesthetically pleasing to the user. Um, yeah, and we're also meeting with a posture expert. Stanford has a posture expert, which is really cool. And uh, seeing if she has any ideas on how to manipulate the uh, handles in order to, to encourage better posture in the long term. So thank you, guys. Excellent. Thank you. Number six is Team Supreme. Hey guys, I'm Julio. I'm Victor. And I'm Harry. And we are Team Supreme working on Power for Veterans. So, the problem. Uh, residents of the VA like to use uh, electronic equipment like laptops, uh, video game equipment, radios, but this is bad. This is also bad. This is also very, very bad. All these cables and wires uh, create a fire hazard and a tripping hazard. Also, sometimes um, these cables are tied to the beds for easier access for electronic e equipment, but that is also very bad because then these beds that are usually easily movable cannot be moved. And we had the opportunity to interview two different uh, long-term patients at the VA as well as the attending nurse. And uh, these patients were long-term, meaning uh, they had been there for a few months. And uh, they were both paralyzed. One was quadriplegic and one was paraplegic. And um, the, the feedback they gave us was that the problem was they have only one outlet available for them. And if they're there for a few months and just one outlet, it's kind of it doesn't make much sense, especially because they're going to have a lot of different electronics. They're going to have their computers. They're going to have their phones, um, among other things. And um, they are paralyzed, so they want um, devices to be very close to them so that they don't have to rely on nurses or uh, on other people to be able to use their devices. Um, and that leads into the independence. Um, and uh, the patient we interviewed uh, was Marty, which a lot of you guys met um, when we went to the VA. He, uh, he's a quadriplegic, um, and he has a lot of different devices that need charging, and uh, he suggested to have USB chargers available for use. Um, and we also interviewed the nurse, and one of the main concerns that she gave was safety. And uh, a lot of the patients rig their outlets in their bed, which are like power strips, and that's very dangerous because you have the outlets and all the electronics right next to the patients. Um, liquid spillage was another concern because if water falls on the electronics, that's going to be a very bad um, yeah, well, and then lastly, a fire hazard and tripping hazard, as Julio mentioned. We have all these cables all over the place, and if we're daisy chaining um, from just one outlet, uh, bad things are going to happen. So when we were looking at existing solutions, we wanted to base it around the table because there's the bed, which we obviously don't want power strips around. There's a floor, which provides a tripping hazard. And the third main thing is a bed, which they all have, and a lot of them can put over, I mean a table, which they can put over their bed. So having something central around that would be nice. And there's a lot of solutions out there, tables with built-in outlets, also add-ons of things you can do to put outlets to tables. But like one of the things you can see is that, one, they don't really protect the outlets from water damage or anything. Or, and two, there's not really any way to manage the cables, which can provide a tripping hazard for the nurses, or just a tangle of wires on the table, which does take up table space. So we went through a few ideas, and one of our first ideas was having something like a box with a power strip inside of it, and then coils that kind of held on to um, 
the wires that come out, and it works. It would work similar to a seatbelt design where you could pull them out and they'd retract back. But one of the downsides of that was that it's moving parts, so it might break easier. It's also probably more expensive, and so we came up with a few other designs as well. Yeah, so uh, one design we had was this uh, table add-on. So you have the uh, table in the, uh, the room, and it's something that you can clamp on top of. It has the uh, power strip connected, and it has holes to feed the, the wires through and clamps that are adjustable. The other design we had was just an entire custom table. And so this has a container inside. It's kind of like those, uh, those desks you guys had in like third grade where they opened up and you put your like pencils and stuff. But instead of putting pencils inside, you have your electronic equipment, your cables, and it has holes so you can feed the cables through. And so the problem with that one is that that would require making a whole custom table and that's kind of pricey. So, um, so our current top design, as you can see from up here, is a cable management system. Um, it would be a semi-permanent design. It would latch onto the bottom of the existing tables um, in the VA rooms. And uh, we have a lot of different pegs. This would uh, work as a cable management system where um, either the nurses or family members can um, attach these uh, chargers for the patients. And then um, you wrap it around, plug it in. You got the outlets right cl very close to you and latch it onto the bottom of the table. Um, this would be semi-permanent. Um, you wouldn't want to take this off every day, but if you move from move to room to room, you can easily just unplug um, the table from the outlet and take the table with you. And once the uh, patients are discharged, you can easily just unclamp the device, um, remove all the different cables, um, and take your electronics with you. So here's a very simple prototype showing that. As you can see, it's very simple. Like, so you just have the table, and then you just clamp it underneath after everything's in there. Um, one of the biggest things we saw was that there's a few regulations that go on with it for fire hazards and things like that for electrical outlets. And like some of them state like you can't even have any outlets at all, like power strips at all, under, except under special circumstances. So with things like that, we'd have to clarify with the nurses there what exactly they mean. Because obviously it's a bit unreasonable to expect some patients to only be limited to one outlet and have no power strips. And then our plan for the rest of the quarter is uh, finalize designs, get measurements, get exactly how we want to build it, and then build, and then keep building, and then keep building, and then no. polish it up and make sure it's super nice. You're iterating. Yeah. 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 Different materials. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we're going to take a little break while we set up for the next uh, team. It's half time right now, so just about uh, three minutes. Everybody ready? Okay, let's go. This is Team Walkabout.
You're on. This is the... Oh, 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 wait. You gotta plug this okay. part into a USB. So we're Team Walkabout. I'm Lauren. I'm Annalisa. And I'm Harini. We're also designing a walker. Um, and you heard a little bit about the functions of walkers. So it's to help you with your balance and stability. Um, and they're used by people um, for a number of reasons. It's, it's a, um, like a lot of people use them. And people have different needs who use them. So they're kind of tricky to suit the needs for everyone. And right now, 6.5 million people in the U.S. use walkers, canes, or crutches to assist with their mobility. So there's a lot of people who can benefit from improving this product. So uh, Barbara, who came in to speak, pitched this uh, project. And she doesn't use a walker herself. We interviewed her. We also interviewed Arnie, who's sitting in the back right now. Uh, he does use a walker. He's at Avenida's. Um, he gave us a lot of good advice, and we also spoke to the director at Avenidas, who gave us a different perspective. Um, and we just learned from these interviews that uh, people have different problems with their walkers. We also inter interviewed my grandma, who uses a walker. <laughs> so there are different types of walkers on the market. So for example, if a standard walker doesn't work for you because uh, you can't fit inside the frame, they have a walker for you, and it's a wider walker. But there's uh, some downfalls because it might not be able to fit into a bus if you're trying to take the ramp onto the bus. Uh, if you want a sporty walker to go hiking with, they have one for you, but this one actually costs $1,300. So you probably don't want to spend that much money on your sporty walker. Um, so we did a lot of brainstorming for what the problems are, and there are quite a few. Uh, brakes are unintuitive, taking it up the stairs is a pain. Um, and then we brainstormed solutions as well, obviously. So our first prototype was polygonal wheels with the resting tiny wheel inside of it. One problem we saw was that the walkers had different requirements for indoor and outdoor use. Like for example, when you go outdoors, your face is gonna wear out faster. So, but wheels don't wear out faster, so we decided to go with a polygonal wheel so it can roll when you push on it, but then it can stay still when you don't use it. Um, also, when you come back in, you take off your shoes, so your height changes, but your walker stays the same height. So to fix that problem, we made a tiny nesting wheel, so you take off the polygonal wheel and you have like a tinier wheel. Um, this is an X walker, and it can collapse when you're not using it, so you can store it easily and it doesn't take up a lot of space. We added tiny feet to its bottom, so it can stand on its own and it, necess it doesn't necessarily need to be on the wall. Another thing we noticed was the front bar encouraged people to lean on it and hunch over. So we, lo we took out the French front bar and then uh, we hinged it in the bottom so people are discouraged from hunching. Uh, our third prototype was this twist and lock mechanism that you can use to adjust heights. Um, it's very secure because uh, the tiny little part goes in the slot and then it doesn't come out. Um, also, this also this lets people to um, change their height from not bending over, <laughs> and they can change the height of both the, both the sides at the same time. So, in the same vein of height adjustment, we also thought about using different levers to adjust the height, so that you could adjust it from the handle instead of having to bend over and to like pull uh, tubes up against each other, which we found really difficult. Um, we also were aiming to be able to adjust multiple legs at the same time instead of one by one. Uh, we also uh, learned from Arnie that a lot of people use skis on their walkers instead of normal uh, rubber stoppers. So, because it lets you go over terrain better, but if you need to put a lot of weight in your walker, it also might allow you to slide. Uh, another problem with a lot of the walkers with wheels is that the braking system is very unintuitive. So if you push on it, then it releases the brake. So if you're falling, then you'll just slide forward. So we designed this system to, uh, when you put pressure on it, it breaks the walker um, more intuitively. Uh, then we also um, prototyped a second X walker. And in this design, we took into account the positioning of the handles and experimented with the different angle of the handles to find something that was more comfortable. And we also uh, looked at the positioning of the X vertically to see what would be the best to encourage stability, but also not encourage the hunching. So for our future steps, we're going to try prototyping with more robust materials like PVC. We also want to take our designs back to Walker users and see what their thoughts are moving forward. 
then we want to narrow this down to one solution and then prepare that solution for the final project. Thank you. Oh, perfect timing. Okay, this is uh, team memory number eight. So I'm Matt, this is Alina, and this is Nico, and we worked on memory, which is our designing your afterlife project. And the idea was how do you preserve kind of yourself and your essence and your memories once you leave the world or you're no longer able to share them? And our idea was to come up with this app that yourself or with assistance can kind of take pictures of key moments in your life and narrate them through audio or video recording so that you can share them with whoever you'd like to share them with. Yeah, so this is just a picture that kind of gets the idea of memories going. Um, so basically what we're trying to encapture is someone's um, essence, not just, you know, their stories, not just like, uh, let's say, what happened to them, but rather like who they were as people. And so that, that's what we're trying to get out of this app. So originally there was a screenshot of um, the first person that Dave actually tried this idea out with named Norman. Um, and so essentially Dave's product when he tried this out was he made a DVD where Norman had all of his kind of favorite photos or key moments that were captured in his life and he narrated it. So, you know, asked and um, asked what each photo was about and then he kind of described almost like a timeline of his life, um, but all the highlights of his life. Unfortunately, um, Norman passed away in 2008, but because of Dave having captured this in a DVD, his wife and his family now has a DVD containing all the key moments in his life and all the stories that were na he narrated along with it. Um, so what do we want to bring to it? We kind of want to bring more interaction to allowing the older adult or whoever, whoever it is who's trying to curate their afterlife to be involved. And so we talked to our parents, our grandparents, and our friends about what type of memories they would want to capture and pass down and share. Um, so we kind of shortlisted all of the questions that we received down to 15. And here, are, we didn't want to put all 15 up, but here are examples of three. Um, asking someone what they're most grateful for, Telling them, tell, asking them to tell you about one of the most difficult moments in their life and also how they would like to be remembered. So part of, in, to identify that you really ask kind of our parents and our grandparents what they would like to share with us, but also we ask ourselves like, what would we would have liked to know from kind of our family members who have gone? So for me, that's my grandfather. Like my grandmother has certain stories, but it's also only one perspective and kind of from a certain age once they've met. There's tons of stuff from my grandfather's father that I don't know, that I would like to know, that kind of in some way have influenced me because they've influenced my father and then, you know, a lot of memories. Yeah. So currently what we looked at, we looked through the App Store, looking at other applications that maybe um, did something similar. And so what we found was this app called StoryCorps. And StoryCorps, the difference is that it's only purely audio. It records stories and it puts it up. and it's basically what you see in that screenshot. Um, so the difference is that we're gonna use visuals as well as audio. We can put the picture and you'll be listening or like watching the actual video within the app. So these were really some really quick wireframes that we drew up about you know, what we would long, want our app to look like from frame to frame. Um, we brainstormed a bunch of crazy design concepts before settling on this. So one of them was an interface that you could talk to so you could say, you know, um, hey Nico, what were one of, one of your biggest regrets? And then it would replay an audio clip that Nico recorded. Um, the second idea was embedding that software in a physical object. So maybe Nico really identifies with a ketchup bottle. And so, you know, you could 
speak to a ketchup bottle and say, hey, Nico, you know, what were some of your biggest regrets? And the speaker from the ketchup bottle would kind of respond um, in his afterlife. And then the third one would be to have a kind of like a frame um, that looks like a portrait, but it's actually a digital screen. And so when you speak to it, it would bring up a video of Nico actually talking about his key memories and the essence of him in that portrait. So this is kind of what our app looks like as of yesterday. And from a feasibility standpoint, nothing is too technologically difficult. It's more of the how do you build an actually useful app in 10 weeks. Um, and then a lot of the trade-offs we went with doing the app versus like a different physical item was the ability for users to use this app alone versus with assistance. And while using it with assistance might be a downside, we thought that having someone there to tell your story with actually lets them kind of ask these follow-up questions or maybe kind of remind you of things that you might have forgotten, like someone's name or like a date. And then the other thing was digital versus the physical memory. Like when you touch a physical picture, that inner that emotional connection is slightly different than when you just look at it digitally, but digital is kind of easier than a physical big book, you have like scrapbook, and you don't have all that text. So yeah, this is another screenshot from our current app. Uh, like we said, audio, video, and pictures. Uh, the main thing that we're doing right now is seeing how we can streamline it, seeing how it's going to be more user friendly, um, and so that's what we're currently working on. We're reiterating the designs. So moving forward, um, there are two things we need to build. We need to allow you to actually record audio, video um, narrations, uh, as well as attach a photo, and also allow you to easily display and share kind of all these memories. Thank you. <clears throat> Next is uh, number nine, Swift Engineering. <laughs> We're Swift Engineering. I'm John. This is Susan. I am Anna. Cool. And we are again Swift Engineering, which started off as a Taylor Swift pun, but hopefully our presentation <laughs> style is equally Swift. So we'll be going through the same thing that everyone's going through. We'll start with what we're working on, how we planned on doing it, what we have so far, and we'll finish off with what Max and we hope will become next. Um, our big focus with this is a subset of the Aesthetic Brace Fairing project, um, the second half of which will be brought up by a group later on today. And the main point is, uh, we've heard from a lot of people this quarter that assistive devices are functional, but they're not pretty and they're not comfortable. So we're focusing on the soft side of things. Uh, we've met Max on pitch day, and he looks fantastic. But underneath that aura of confidence <laughs> is the brace which supports the reduced growth in his limb. It's obvious once you see it. It's unwieldy because it's very large and complicated. And it's uncomfortable because it's a hunk of metal and plastic. And wouldn't it be nice if instead of that thing on the left, we had something soft, maybe not as supportive, but comfortable, easy to slip on. So that's where we get built for comfort and for speed in terms of putting it on and off. So our scope is to design, build, and refine that soft sleeve, get feedback from him, and improve on it. We'll start off by working directly with him and possibly expand it to other people. So once we've identified what exactly we need to do, move forward in determining what we needed to do in terms of prototyping and really bringing this idea to life. So he has his brace, but in addition, when he's not wearing his brace, his leg also looks really obvious. And so aesthetics was absolutely number one priority for him. And we discovered this and we um, did a little bit of design interviewing with him in our first session. We really found out what really mattered to him and maybe some what are his secondary concerns. So his number one priority was aesthetics. He wanted his leg to look just as normal as his normal leg. The second, two, the second and third priorities included, as we have here, comfort and versatility. He doesn't want his leg to just look nice for maybe five seconds or 10 seconds in a day. He's gonna be, um, he's gonna want his leg to look normal for eight or 10 hours a day at the very least. Uh, maybe if he stays at home, he'll be wearing such a sleeve, maybe for at least four or five hours, and he wants to be comfortable doing so. Um, and Max, he 
even though we are designing specifically <coughs> for Max, Max is not the only person we're getting input from. Um, for example, we also looked at what his current brace actually does um, and saw a little bit of um, indirect input from his um, from his doctors in terms of um, in terms of how his brace had come to the state it already is, what kinds of aesthetic purposes it serves and where it kind of falls flat. Um, there we were able to find some opportunities to really build into um, our leg. Also, <laughs> also, in figuring, uh, also in figuring out not only what his doctors say, but also how he fits into the athletic community. He's very passionate about athletics, and of course if his soft sock is able to look really great in front of his friends, he's going to be all the more happy. We did a little bit of um, research in terms of what is being done currently in the world of orthotics, in terms of making the, making braces more aesthetically pleasing. There actually wasn't that much going on. There's a lot more going on in the prosthetics field, especially with the designs that bespoke and related firms are um, putting out. So these two examples here um, are from bespoke um, and really focus on crafting out a human form of a leg or a limb, um, but instead of it being an actual limb of somebody else or something, it's just a hunk of metal or um, some type of shell. And we wanted to do something similar um, in terms of really filling out that form that legs, um, that Max's other leg doesn't really have right now, um, but in a way that is very comfortable um, and easily doable for him. So this is a, really the money shot here of all the designs that we had here. Um, we knew through um, multiple sketches, we figured out what part of his leg really need to be filled out with form. And some things that we wanted to work on are exactly how would such a leg, or sorry, how would such a sock actually stay on the form without falling down? Um, what kind of materials we're going to use for both cloth and the foam itself? The foam needs to be um, pliable and still yet hold its form. And also, st we needed to figure out what the trade-off is between appearance and actual functionality. All right, I haven't sewed since seventh grade home ec, <laughs> but luckily we didn't have to start from scratch because Max had already built this prototype. So we decided that there were some improvements that could be made with this. Um, the first thing we had to do was actually not related to this at all. We had to make a model of his leg so we could put in the prototype. This is the model of the leg via pink foam. So we could put it in the brace and see what it looked like. So whatever adjustments, we could see what that would look like as if he were actually wearing it. The next thing we tackled was this knee joint. So if you can imagine without this little bulky portion, what you have is a big piece of foam here, big piece of foam here, and this jarring visual space in between. So we wanted to have something here that would fill up the space, but also allow the knee to bend. We also looked at, um, as Anna mentioned, uh, the brace kept on sli slipping down because you, when you're walking, there's a lot of motion in your knee. Uh, so we decided to use silicone tape to attach it to the waistband and then prevent it from slipping down. Unfortunately, we tried that and it failed miserably, but we learned something. So now we have another solution that we're going to pursue and that potentially will help it to prevent it from slipping down. Cool. So what's coming up? We've got finishing, working up with our initial prototype, moving into a more high-res organic form using thinner layers of <laughs> internal foam, and also experimenting with different patterns. So we'll be moving away from this stock Nike sleeve and implementing more visually appealing patterns that fit both his aesthetic and his community's aesthetic. Thank you. Okay, home stretch number 10, Magic Makers.
everyone, we are the Magic Makers, and we're going to talk to you guys about the Magical Bridge Playground Project. So, I'm BJ, I'm a senior. I'm Akua, junior. And I'm Natalie, I'm a sophomore. And we're all studying mechanical engineering. So, little background on the Magical Bridge Playground. It's a park, it's a playground located in Mitchell Park, which is here in Palo Alto. It opened last April, and it's a playground that was designed to be socially inclusive and ex excessive for um, people, both children and parents, who have physical or developmental disabilities. The way the park is structured is it's split into six different zones, and we will be working in the music zone, which is a very interesting area in the park. A little video clip. <laughs> yeah, we're going to show you kind of what is in this part of the park. There's a really cool harp, and the way that it's sort of set up is it's a laser harp, and it's motion sensing. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, you guys can see kind of when you like wave your hand through it or when you walk through it, it makes noises. So you can, like kids can run through it, kids can play and dance and do whatever, and it's really cool. And the tones that it makes, are intentionally made to be calming for uh, people with autism, for children with autism. So it's a very interesting sort of aspect of the park. It's really cool. Um, yeah. Yep. So the issue with this is that within this area, it looks very simple. And so kids often miss this harp because they don't see it because it's really big or, you know, they're just not... Um, excited to go into this area because it doesn't look as exciting as some of the other areas in the park. So what we need to do is come up with an enticing way to draw kids into the music zone. So first we interviewed multiple people. First, uh, a friend of mine from high school who has a prosthetic leg. And then we interviewed Olenka, Jill, and Jay, who are the founders and two of the board members for the park. And then we interviewed Jay again. And within that, we got ideas of sort of like what people um, with disabilities may want in a park, what, you know, would have been nice to have, stuff like that. Also, what they need in the Magical Bridge Playground and what could be developed more. And we gave like a pitch of our various ideas and prototypes and kind of like developed our ideas further. Okay, so in terms of brainstorming, we went in three, diff three main um, different directions um, when thinking about what would be stimulating for kids and what would be exciting for them to play with. Um, we looked at things that would be like audibly appealing, tangible, and um, visually appealing. Um, a lot of our initial set of ideas came from like existing existing designs because like the possibilities for toys are like endless. So looking at things that would be audibly appealing, we were thinking about like instruments or little toys that would make noises, different kinds of noises. But we actually ruled this kind of thing out because we felt we didn't want to make the music zone like overstimulating, and we didn't want to create like too many noises and things like that. So then, when thinking about things that would be visually appealing, we were we wanted to incorporate something like colorful and like exciting looking. So we had an idea of like multicolored plexiglass, um, like incorporating that into whatever design that we have, and like you see gears here, like making things like colorful, um, things like that. We thought would be a good idea. And then lastly, um, we were really interested in making something that was like tangibly, like tangible and like interesting, like, different textures. Um, something that we wanted to incorporate was Braille um, because we felt like it would be a good opportunity to um, target and appeal to those who have visual impairments um, and, and those people who come to the park. Uh, so. Great. So where are we going? Our direction with our designs is really based, are driven by our space. As you can see, we have the park here. And toward the end of the, the music zone, we have a pod and a bench. And between those, we have 13 feet of, oops, 13 feet of uh, fence to, to work with. So going off of that, um, we're really going for a sensory tactile experience. So we found that throughout the park, there isn't very much there for anybody with a visual impairment. So we really want to um, design for that. So here we have sort of an initial idea for a sensory wall. And over there, we have a, a more developed one in which we have different panels which we can show next. Uh, so one of them is a music book, and we're gonna have some braille instructions there along with written instructions so that the kids can en engage with the book and also interact with the, the, the harp. Uh, we also have 
uh, some puzzles which we're designing, which can be, uh, which can use Braille and different textures so that um, they can be all manually done or just, uh, done by, you know, pretty much by hand, so you don't even have to look at them, and you can engage with the puzzles and figure them out. Um, different shapes which fit into holes, things of that nature. And of course, different toys which kids can engage with with different textures. A uh, clown on a spring, a little dinosaur, a ball oh, with different, with an interesting color or texture to it. Um, and these will all be attached to the wall. So looking forward, we need to iterate through our, our prototypes and figure out really what is the appropriate uh, stimulating and comfortable textures, colors, uh, designs, uh, things that will really be engaging. And of course, we need to take safety in, into consideration as this is a part. So all of our designs are going to have to be passed through uh, a series of people who are going to uh, essentially certify it and allow it to be, to be in place. Um, so far, we looked at some other things which are pretty similar, which are being sold on the market right now. However, for this kind of uh, equipment, the companies that sell it uh, have to sell it at a pretty high price because they uh, obviously aren't being sought out very much around the country. So right now we're looking at about $10,000 just for the equipment, not including the cost of the business and the profit and the installation and everything that's going to have to go in there. So as you can see, the designs that we have aren't uh, very engineering, they're not difficult in an engineering standpoint or a technical standpoint, um, but we just need to make sure that we have all the textures right and that we can get it passed in terms of safety for this playground. Say thank you. Thank you. That's it. Number 11 is very well. I'm Jess, and Lisa's not here, but we're faring well. <laughs> All right, so what our problem statement? Basically, as the other group said, who's also working with Max, we wanted to create a product that's used for people for orthotics, and there's a lot of products on the market um, for people with prosthetic limbs, but for orthotics, there's really just not as much out there. And, Having a limb that looks physically different from your peers has a huge psychological effect. And so we really wanted to kind of dig into that and how we can help that. So for our interview, we were lucky enough to be paired with Max. Um, he was one of our, if not our greatest um, resource during the whole project. Um, he's an engineer. He's an athlete. He's someone who's just really taken destiny over his limb and his, like, just his life, um, and he has a lot of knowledge to share with us um, about the challenges with his leg and his brace. So, as you can see on the picture on the right, um, okay, um, we can see that his right leg is severely deformed. It looks completely different than his left one. And he posed to us a challenge of creating an aesthetic outer casing, or fairing, um, which would make the right leg look similar um, and mirror the leg on the left. And with this, it needed to be able to mesh well with his current brace and something that could go over it and be easily attached and detached. Um, so some existing solutions, I know um, the other group also mentioned some of these, but unique, these folks, there's a lot of really cool designs, but these are all with people with prosthetic limbs. Um, and for people with orthotics, there's just really not as much out there. Um, and eventually produce like a highly aesthetic um, like 
piece of plastic or whatever material it ends up being that will go on Max's leg that he's happy to wear out and about and the crowd to show up. Um, and so a large portion of this, um, actually, can you? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so like the design constraints uh, were pretty straightforward. Um, visually, like we knew what area we had to fill out. Um, and so it really became a challenge of like, how are we going to pull this off elegantly, practically, in the span of the remaining six weeks of the quarter that we had. Um, so with our initial brainstorming, we covered uh, yeah, the area that it had to fill out. We came up with a couple different attachment mechanisms. I thought a lot about how we would uh, move forward with the materials we need to construct this and how we would go about manufacturing this. Um, so in our first meeting with Max, uh, we used cardboard as a very low resolution, quick prototyping material. Um, we grid scored it so that we could fold it, uh, fly it around the leg, um, play with different cutouts and how it would interface with the existing uh, fairing. We discovered that the curvature really mattered. Um, I thought about how we would use like, the same to interface cleanly with the existing um, knee extender and fair, or brace the back stats on his leg. Um, in our next iteration, we needed to make a more rigid model of the same prototype. Uh, the cardboard was great when you held it up to his leg, but you had to hold it really precisely in place. Um, so we used the SAM splint, which is a pliable uh, like metal inset um, foam on the outside, like a common splinting material. Um, we were able to cut that up and get that into like a rough 3D approximation of the shape we wanted that would pull its own form. Um, and so at this point, we realized that we were going to need to move forward with some sort of mold making, uh, either a lamp or a thermoplastic form, uh, to create the final product. And this was something we needed to start producing very early on in order to have enough time to iterate. Um, and so in, in, approaching the challenge of, sorry, you go back. Oh, sorry. Um, in approaching the challenge of making a mold, we thought about first being added to manufacturing, or subtracting manufacturing. Sorry. So we'd start out with like a large block of modulin, like carve it away so we got the leg shape, and then that would be our mold and we could form over that. But we discovered that modulin and like Size that we needed, uh, which is about like yay big, um, cost us about like hundred dollars a block, um, and so that was just prohibitively expensive. Um, instead, we turned to additive manufacturing, so creating like thin slices, gluing those together, and then like filling the gaps, sanding that down, um, and constructing a mold that way. So we moved forward with that and created a model in CAD um, using our SAM split that I showed earlier. Uh, we took dimensions from that and made a rough approximation of SolidWorks, uh, created a surface using measurements off of the SAM split. Um, and with that surface, we were able to um, slice it up into sections, uh, laser cut those as quarter inch sheets of Dura, uh, glue those together. Uh, and then in the next slide, uh, we covered it in Mondo, which is a, a sandable uh, like body filler commonly used, commonly used in automotive. Um, sanded that down to get like a really smooth shape. Um, and then we were able to do a first thermal form pull at the PRL uh, to create our first uh, first iteration of the part of the leg split. Uh, so we had split it into two parts uh, because you can only wrap over 180 degrees with a thermal former, but this is a kind of a rough approximation of the shape we want with the final um, leg fairing. Um, and then with the two halves of this, we'll be able to make the cutouts. Um, it's clear initially so that we, it's like easier to work with. We can line it up with the legs, see where it needs to go in or go out, um, edit the cat accordingly. Um, and the nice part about the fondo is that we can like continue to sand it, sculpt it, um, and then eventually produce a final iteration with either thermoforming or perhaps making a negative mold and doing uh, fiberglass or carbon fiber layout. Cool. So moving forward, we're um, really excited that we got the vacuum former mold, um, and we met with Max today and kind of tried to test out this piece against his leg. Um, in the future, we're going to continue kind of just um, iterating over the shape to make sure that's exactly how we want it to look, and it looks perfect and interfaces perfectly um, with his leg. In addition, we're just going to look at what materials we want the final um, product to be. Um, if we want to continue using PETG, which is this is, or a different thickness. Um, and then lastly, the latch or how we're going to attach it so it seamlessly um, molds with his leg, but he's able to attach and detach it very quickly and easily. Thank you. Last but not least, Team Magicians. the Magical Bridge Playgrounds. I'm Sophia. I'm Ashley. And I'm Steven. All right. I'll try not to be too repetitive, but in general around the nation, um, parks have to comply with 
88, and not many actually do, and the ones who do really cater toward uh, wheelchair users, but the way they do that, they just, uh, the wheelchair users can't actually interact with the park. They have like a sidewalk they can wheel around maybe. And in here in Palo Alto, we have 34 public parks, but there was before this playground no park that catered to all types of people. And so, yeah, the Magic play, uh, Bridge Playground is the first and only all-inclusive playground. Um, about 11% of each community's population will have a disability, and in Palo Alto, that would be a little over 10,000 individuals, which is like, that's a lot. And so for this playground, okay. So we interviewed a Lincoln J. I was there in that other picture with the other group. And so they, we, there are six zones, and we have a lot of, they have a lot of, they have slides and uh, spinning things, horizontal um, monkey bars, but what they were missing was tactile objects. And so both of us were kind of uh, working on tactile objects. But our, our zone, there's a tree house, which you guys will see next week, a tree house area, and behind that, another tree area with a fence, which is kind of a resting area. And so what they really want us to do is create something tactile that we could uh, perhaps put on the walls or around the resting area on the netting that people with visual impairments or with everyone can just, yeah, use. Right, so what already exists for this need? Um, within the, the treehouse, they actually have a couple of zones that kind of look a little bit like this. Um, you have the wood shop, and they also have like a cake baking session. And you can kind of see they have these like tools, they are affixed down, and, you can, and someone who is visually impaired can interact in the way of feeling around, feeling the shape of these objects. So it's kind of like a really interesting way to learn. Um, but it's not necessarily the most um, it doesn't necessarily allow for extremely independent exploration. Um, and there's really only one type of texture here, and that is the smoothness of the wood, which is important for safety. But there are definitely other types of materials, textures, and fabrics that could be very um, interesting to use. One thing that Jay always um, or referred to it in his uh, emails was um, eye candy, or, or tactile eye candy. That's, that's kind of how he, he phrased it. Um, so what already exists for this need? Um, these squeeze, if you were to Google tactile toys, um, you would find squeeze puffer balls, you would find these kind of like tactile push pin um, art, and also Play-Doh. I think m most of us may have interacted with Play-Doh at some point in our lives. Um, it's a great experience in your hands, it feels good, and you also have that kind of independent um, action. So brainstormed ideas and concepts. We came up with a lot of things that we wanted to do. We kind of wanted to frame it as this is an art ins installation that people could interact with. So we thought about a tactile globe, like some sort of spinning object with different textures and different fabrics that would be kind of like, kind of cool for people to play with. But um, we had a lot of issues with thinking about how we were going to mount it. How many of it could we re re like reasonably create that would allow many children to interact with it at once. Um, we thought about this idea called Goliath Games, which was maybe um, a tactile version of the childhood tic-tac-toe game that you may be familiar with from other playgrounds. Um, we thought about Connect Four, but then there's the problem of <coughs> movable pieces. We can't have people removing pieces from the part, um, or perhaps there's a choking hazard. So there was actually a lot of considerations when thinking of not only designing for people of all abilities, but people of all ages. Um, yeah, so I will, let's get the last one in. Okay. So for our top designs and alternatives, we have the kinetic sandbox, and what this is, is basically it's taking the idea of the traditional sandbox in a playground and putting it inside of the treehouse. As you can see here, it'll be located on one of the areas where there's like a tactile game. In this specific location, there's like a little wooden iPod. Um, and, but the problem with the sandbox in the area is that it's not self-contained. So we're trying to think, uh, one of the challenges with this idea is trying to develop something to make sure that the sand is contained. One of the ways to address that is using kinetic sand, which sticks together. And we actually have kinetic sand right here. Uh, so instead of being like a whole mess where there's sand being put everywhere and you have to occasionally maintain it, we hope that by, having it, by using kinetic sand, uh, we can have it be mostly self-contained. Uh, but the issue still is that you can still remove the sand from the sandbox. So uh, something, some things that we have thought of to address that is kind of putting a little installment uh, to make sure that 
all the sand stays inside of like a little glass box area and the way that the kids would interact with, with using gloves or something of that sort, kind of like the bead blaster near the PRL. And um, the reason why we like this idea is that because it harkens back to like the childhood wonder of discovery. Uh, at the bottom we could put some fossils or shells and uh, in that way still interact with a lot of tactile toys. Um, another idea is the slot board track, which is a kind of like a combo of train tracks and wire beat games. Uh, basically, there's a little sl there's a, a slot that goes on a set path, and there's a slot holder that's attached to the back with a sort of toy in the front. And you can attach this to a mural of um, some sort of tactile art, so that uh, people, whether you're blind or you cannot see can uh, touch and kind of feel the motions of the toy. Uh, and these murals would be, these tackle murals would be located at the tree rest area along the fences. So here's a pew chart of our two top ideas. Uh, what you can see is that kinetic sand tray does have like a huge negative and safety considerations and durability because if sand is removed or et cetera, you have to replace it. And uh, something that you always have to consider at a playground is like weathering from the children and from the elements, because these are being constantly like rained upon or such sun is constantly shining on it. Uh, lastly, for some future steps and challenges, uh, specifically for the slot board track, which is looking like our primary idea, we need to figure out how to mount that onto the fences because the fences are already designed and preset there. And these, this is a sort of an add-on. We're imagining to make it out of something hardy like wood that's polished. And that might make it quite heavy because uh, the fences are about like this length of this table. And uh, another thing is designing to allow the toys to have a little bit more degree of freedom than just the preset slot track because, uh, you know, like, I don't know about you guys, but when I go to the dentist's office as a kid, I didn't want to play with the wire bead games because it was just kind of like a boring preset thing, one and done type thing. So, uh, and, and another thing we have to worry about is ensure accessibility for users on the wheelchair because the treehouse area is sort of geared towards um, people on wheelchairs and we want to make sure that they'll be able to reach and interact with the art mural. Thank you. Thank you for hanging in there. Uh, please leave your evaluation forms at your desk. Um, and uh, have a great weekend next week. Um, exoskeletons, and next Thursday we're going to be at the Magical Bridge Playground.